There are only two Marvel superhero films coming to theaters in 2024. Deadpool and Wolverine hits theaters this July, and it's the only film officially in the MCU that's coming to theaters, which is good because we need time to miss these films in order to want to see more. But it's easy to forget that the other Marvel film, it's not an MCU film, but it's still in that general family, that's coming out this same year, 2024, is Venom The Last Dance. How fast do you think you can get that thing to go without killing it? Only one way to find out! And it's stunning to me that Venom has received a trilogy of films without Spider-Man as a core component. And honestly, I've kind of dug all of them so far. Like, they're messy and chaotic, but there's still a lot of fun. Without Tom Hardy, I don't think these films would work nearly as well, much like how the lesser Wolverine films would not have worked without Hugh Jackman. But I think it's odd, right? Deadpool, Venom, and Wolverine are the only Marvel characters showing up. Craven the Hunter does not count. I don't, don't know that movie. All three of these characters are essentially side characters who became immensely popular very quickly. Wolverine first appeared in the pages of The Incredible Hulk and later joined the X-Men. Before becoming so popular, he arguably eclipsed the mutants. He became the poster child for mutant kind. And Venom, who was initially going to be like a one-off villain, became the culmination of an entire arc, the Black Suit arc, and then became this huge hit. Put his face on the cover, your comic sold, to the point where they put him in a bunch of miniseries throughout the 90s. And Deadpool? Well, he started off as Rob Liefeld's knockoff of Deathstroke the Terminator before drawing in a massive audience with his humor and style. And bizarrely, all three characters have an odd relationship in the comics. And I want to talk about that specifically, how both Wolverine and Venom share this strange rivalry and also how Deadpool's in there too, because I, I had to fit Deadpool in there somewhere. The SEO gods demand it. But, you know, we're really focusing on Wolverine and Venom with this one. You know nothing about us, but we know everything about you. You see us everywhere, even in your nightmares. Let's start with the early years of Venom. He was primarily kept in Spider-Man books for the longest time, but Marvel soon figured out a secret. If you put Venom on the cover of a book, it will sell. And Venom started to quickly cross over with other Marvel heroes. Ghost Rider and Johnny Blaze, this was back during the Danny Ketch years, so Johnny Blaze wasn't Ghost Rider at the time, would have to work with Venom during the Spirits of Venom crossover event, which also featured Hobgoblin, Demo Goblin, and all other sorts of crazy stuff. Daredevil defended Venom from a murder charge in the Trial one-shot, and later the Trial miniseries. All this, however, would culminate in Venom's numerous miniseries, which formed the creative inspiration behind the Venom trilogy of films. But we're going to put Venom's miniseries aside, including the one where he fights the Juggernaut. Don't worry about that for right now. For right now, let's talk about Marvel Comics Presents issues 117 to 122. These six issues from 92 feature the storyline Claws and Webs. It's an arc that pits Venom and Wolverine against each other. The two are dragged into the Nightmare Realm by the villain Nightmare. I know, very creative. While Wolverine quickly figures out what's going on, Venom, who at this point in time is less familiar with supernatural hijinks, thinks Wolverine is at fault and lashes out at him. First guy he sees, he attacks. Now the story is mostly just an excuse to pit Wolverine and Venom together. They both deal some painful blows to the other. Venom at one point impales Logan to a tree, which is reminiscent, I think, in hindsight of Logan. However, the two ultimately decide to work together in order to stop Nightmare and escape the Nightmare Realm together. It's a very simple comic, nothing to write home about, but hold on to that. We're going to come back to this, and I think by the time we're done, you're going to see how this is a crucial step in Venom's overall arc. How? Bear with me. Now, the other important thing to keep in mind is that Marvel Comics Presents is an anthology. They were like four different stories per issue, and they'd be told in many chunks from month to month to month. 
Um, so there was no real chance in this format to tell a really deep and involved storyline. It was basically told in vignettes that were digestible and you could put the book aside and wait for next month. As such, there isn't a particularly deep story to Webs and Claws, but it does showcase Venom and Wolverine fighting and then working together. Strange though that their enemy is Nightmare because he's such a cosmic adversary, but again, I digress. Now, the chronology of this gets a little murky, but I'm gonna jump ahead to a 2018 annual issue of Venom. Because chronologically, this takes place after the event I just mentioned. In this issue, the two characters get into an altercation at a bar. I know, shocking. That results in them attacking each other with their claws and teeth, but also their words. Venom starts by comparing his pain to Logan, saying that he's experienced pain unlike anything Wolverine has ever experienced, which, I mean, Wolverine just kind of laughs off because, I mean, look, it's Wolverine. It's pretty clear that Wolverine does not take Venom all that seriously. Wolverine's deepest cut isn't with his claws, it's with his words, because Wolverine mocks Venom for obsessing over Spider-Man. This annual could have just been a one and off fight, much like the previous event, but it really ends on a note that I think gets to the core of why Wolverine and Venom's rivalry is so interesting. Wolverine ends the fight by insulting Venom, telling Eddie that he's not just driven by hatred, he's consumed by it. It destroys any hope of his potential. He's shackled down by his grudges. Logan ends by asking if Venom is ever going to be more than what he is currently. And the obvious implication, of course, is that once Wolverine was driven by that same rage and hatred that he's saying is consuming Venom. But rather than let that destroy him, he allowed it to give him purpose to grow, to become more than who he really was at that time. And while Venom ends the issue indignant, a seed is set here, one that Eddie uses to grow. You're a survivor. Always have been. I thought I was just an animal with claws. Now, granted, this is a retcon. However, this event also takes place before Amazing Spider-Man 375, and in turn, the Lethal Protector miniseries that launched Venom's career as an established anti-hero in the Marvel Universe. Amazing Spider-Man 375 is a really interesting issue because it kind of ends Venom's tenure as Spider-Man's main adversary at that time. In the previous issue, 374, Venom kidnaps Peter Parker's parents. I know, they're dead, but they were kind of brought back, but really they were life model decoys. Comics are weird. It's all Harry Osborn's fault, ultimately. Anyway, so Venom sees Peter's parents as innocents that he has to protect from Spider-Man's toxic influence. The issue ends with Spider-Man bringing Anne Weying, Eddie's ex-wife, to Venom's hideout. And they engage in a conversation, and they get into a fight, but then uh, I think a Ferris wheel almost drops on Anne, and the two superheroes save Anne from this falling debris. And in that moment, Venom kind of sees himself in Spider-Man, sees that he's not really there to hurt everyone, and of course, Anne has to push a little bit, but at the end of the day, the issue ends with Venom and Spider-Man entering into a truce. Neither goes after the other, and the truce is maintained. And from that point on, there was a period of time where Venom didn't go after Spider-Man, and Spider-Man didn't go after Venom. They'd even worked together a few times, too. Obviously, this comic was written decades before the Venom annual from 2018, but it's hard not to recontextualize this story with that retcon. That this incident at a bar between Venom and Wolverine helped lead to this change, this truce in an to an extent. By being told he could be more than what he is, it forced him to maybe see himself as, how can I be more than what I am? And it's telling that this, along with working with Spider-Man to fight Carnage, really I think helps inform Venom's turn from a villain to an anti-hero. And in turn, this decision to become an anti-hero would bring Venom and Wolverine together again, which I think completes a loose trilogy of stories set in the same rough time that illustrate Venom's rivalry with Wolverine. And this story is the Venom miniseries Venom, Tooth, and Claw. Tooth and Claw sees Wolverine and Venom team up again, this time against a mutant from Wolverine's book named Dirtnap. Dirtnap's mutant ability allows him to absorb living people and change into them. 
this is a villain that Wolverine fought before. This villain ab absorbed a small boy, and he'd used the form of the small boy to taunt Wolverine, to show him his failures, show him how he can never surpass, you know, his limits, how he can, how he never would succeed, use the guilt of his failure to kind of manipulate him. Wolverine beats him by throwing a rat at him and makes Dirtnap turn into a rat, which I digress. Dirtnap's not a heavy hitter villain. He looks horrifying, but he's not a heavy, he's not a juggernaut. He's not a Omega Red. He's just a bad guy. In Tooth and Claw, however, Dirtnap decides to get back at Wolverine by absorbing some more people. But he makes one mistake. He absorbs Venom first. <laughs> Dirtnap's first mistake is to absorb Eddie Brock, but he struggles to do so because the symbiote affects his ability to absorb a person. Now, it's important to note that Dirtnap before this has only failed to absorb one other person, Wolverine. This immediately draws a connection between Venom and Wolverine in, th in that they're both difficult to absorb because of their complicated identity. They're not just one thing, they're a blend of things, adamantium and, and mutant power, symbiote and man. Now, in a fitting fashion, Venom breaks free of Dirtnap and frees himself from this entrapment in his body right as Wolverine is passing by. Oh, and then they all get sucked into a strange dim dimensional vortex by a woman named Chimera, which, if I begin to explain, this multiversal pirate will be here all day, but just trust me, they're in between reality now. To make matters more complicated, Dirtnap chooses to absorb several more people, including Scream. Scream is a female symbiote who a lot of you guys might know from Insomniac Spider-Man 2. <laughs> However, this version is not Mary Jane, it's Donna something. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so Venom wants to just rip Dirtnap apart for just to stop this guy now. But Wolverine rationalizes there might be a way to save everyone Dirtnap absorbed. Now Wolverine and Venom fight, but they ultimately defer to Wolverine's mission. Save everyone, stop Dirtnap. But it's ultimately Venom who figures out how to split Dirtnap from those he absorbed. He tricks Dirtnap into taking the form of Scream, which results in Scream's symbiote re-emerging, and much like how Venom did before, it disrupts Dirtnap's mutant ability. Scream escapes, but Venom then uses Scream's symbiote to further disrupt Dirtnap's abilities freeing everyone he has ever absorbed, including the little boy who he'd used to guilt Wolverine for his failure. Even Logan doesn't expect Venom to follow through with his plan. He expects Venom to just kill Dirtnap, but he doesn't. And yeah, Dirtnap and Chimera eventually get sucked into some interdimensional implosion. It's weird and wild, but at this point, it's part of the course for comics. So to recap, Marvel Comics presents Wolverine and Venom fight for a bit and then stop a big bad. Venom Annual. Wolverine and Venom fight in a bar, and there's some tough words exchanged. And then finally, in the Venom minis, we see Venom and Wolverine team up again, and this time work together to save everyone. We see Venom grow in response to each encounter. We see him first start as a reactionary figure, we see him kind of be more self-reflective, and then we see him outright as a hero who puts aside his instinct to act in a way that benefits everyone. He manages to do what Wolverine himself could not. And though neither of them are ever friends, this shows growth. In fact, Venom and Wolverine pretend to come to blows at one point to distract Chimera in the mini. It's a fun little story, but in context of this arc, shows how Venom's interactions with Wolverine are a marker of his growth and in some ways might be spurring on growth that impacts his relationship with other characters. Of course, I left out a key detail. Wolverine, before ever meeting Venom, was kind of Venom. Kinda. In the comic Web of Venom, v Vietnam, <laughs> I know, it's a Vietnam story, we see how S.H.I.E.L.D. used symbiotes to enhance Vietnam soldiers. Specifically, they discover the draconic symbiote Grendel, which is tied in with Null, dark god of the symbiotes, and use parts of Grendel's body to enhance soldiers. In an effort, of course, to replace Captain America. Guess we made our point. But our job isn't done. As part of the Sim Soldier program, Rex Strikeland hosted the symbiote Tyrannosaurus back during the Vietnam War with a squad of symbiote soldiers that laid to waste everything in sight. However, Grendel, as I said, is tied to the dark god of symbiotes, Null, who used the influence of Grendel and these symbiotes to sow chaos on Earth. 
Logan was sent in by Nick Fury to subdue the symbiote soldiers. And while Wolverine succeeded, it was not before Tyrannosaurus took over Logan, forcing Fury and his men to separate Logan from Tyrannosaurus. Now, the symbiote would later take on the form of Rex after all the soldiers were killed off, and but he already assembled, assimilated Rex's consciousness into his being. It's weird, but this recontextualizes a lot. Keep in mind, this is pre-X-Men Logan. His history as a soldier is tied in with symbiotes. When Wolverine encounters Venom in all those occasions, he's already met someone who has had a symbiote in them and was overtaken by symbiote influence. So he understands what he's dealing with to an extent. Further, the Weapon Plus and Sim Soldier program are both means to create superhuman government agents. Oh, and I forgot to mention one thing. Weapon Plus took the Sim Soldier program from S.H.I.E.L.D. and absorbed it into their program, resulting in the Weapon V program, also known as Project Venom. This project would ultimately lead to Carnage absorbing the Grendel symbiote, resulting in the Absolute Carnage storyline, a massive event that Venom was again instrumental in resolving. It's strange how intertwined Venom and Wolverine, and by extension Deadpool, are. After all, all of them have ties in the Weapon Plus storyline, with Weapon X being Logan's experience and Weapon V being Venom's experience. It's also strange how Venom and Wolverine's arcs would become kind of inverted. They're parallel, but opposite. Wolverine in the comics is introduced as an agent of the government who breaks away from it to form his own identity. Whereas Venom, by contrast, begins to form his own identity, in part due to his interactions with Wolverine, only to become an agent of the government. In the minis, he becomes an agent of the government and this ends badly. But later on, when Norman Osborn overtakes S.H.I.E.L.D. after Secret Invasion, he takes Scorpion, who was at the time Venom after purchasing the symbiote from Eddie Brock. Whole story there, we'll get to that later. Norman Osborn turns Scorpion into a government-appointed Spider-Man. Of course, with the Siege storyline, Norman Osborn launches an invasion on Asgard, and during this event, Scorpion is stripped of the Venom symbiote. This, in turn, puts the symbiote in the hands of the government yet again. And this time, they use the Venom symbiote as a weapon, again, much like the Sim Soldier program. Only this time, it's given to Flash Thompson, who becomes Agent Venom. Wait, wait. Oh, I'm totally lost. This is a strange inversion of Wolverine's arc. And of course, Eddie would later get the symbiote and use it to deal with the resulting chaos that Weapon Plus left behind. But that's down the road. It's also interesting because Logan wouldn't be the only Wolverine Venom would interact with. Except Eddie didn't interact with X-23. Flash Thompson would. The Circle of Four is arguably one of the coolest storylines to feature Flash Thompson's Venom. It teams up Venom, Red Hulk, Ghost Rider, and X-23 against the forces of hell itself. And it's frankly just so cool. But the gist of it for our intents and purposes for this video is that it shows again the intertwined legacies of both Venom and Wolverine, even across legacy characters. Now, here's where it gets even stranger. When you take into account alternate versions, it's strange how often Venom and Wolverine merge, with Logan taking the Venom symbiote or having to outrun a Venomized T-Rex and Old Man Logan. But yeah, be it Ultimate Spider-Man or Spider-Man Web of Shadows in games, Wolverine and Venom keep bumping into each other. Got it. So even in games, it's odd how often we combine these two separate characters. I think a part of it has to do with how similar they are in pop culture. Both are essentially side characters who became hugely popular very quickly. They're both outsiders, defined by their pain who channel that rage into strength. And both, ultimately, are people who grow beyond their initial incarnations, their feral, hateful sides, and become heroes in their own right. You're an animal then, you're an animal now. I just gave you claws. You are a loser, Eddie. And yes, a lot of this interpretation is 
informed by a retcon, a Venom annual storyline. But that retcon exists and I think really adds rather than subtracts to both characters. See, one component of Wolverine I personally love is how Wolverine is a mentor to wayward souls. The X films actually does quite well with both his relationship with Rogue and later X-23. <laughs> It even comes full circle with his connections to Xavier in the films. The Professor helps Logan come out of his darkness in the early films, and later on, Logan repays that by not once but twice helping Professor X out of a dark period in both Days of Future Past with time travel when he's at his lowest, and in the distant future in Logan where that sidekick just starts to undergo dementia and lose control of his abilities. Logan is a caretaker. He repays the kindness dealt to him. Now, in the comics, this is done more frequently with Logan, most notably with Kitty Pride in the 80s and X-23 in the 2000s. I think even Jubilee has some moments, too. But Logan's a teacher at the X-Mansion. He's able to use his traumatic past to help those undergoing pain. He helps people become better and better equipped to deal with new pain. And sure, Venom's not a student, but it's clear that he's a kindred spirit. Most of Wolverine's enemies are kindred spirits in this sense. Sabretooth, Lady Deathstrike. But the difference here is that Logan helps Venom. They're not friends. They're barely even co-workers at times. But the impact Logan had on Venom, thanks in part to this retcon, is hard to overstate. It elevates what are two separate goofy crossover stories from the 90s into end points and start points of an arc. But does Venom impact Logan's arc? Well, I don't know. But it's clear that Logan had an impact on Venom, and that Venom's arc would continue to go in an interesting, tragic direction. Venom in the 90s was defined by Spider-Man, either as his adversary or something that he was growing past. He no longer carried a grudge for most of the minis, but that did shift and he regressed in coming into the 2000s in ways that ultimately hurt Eddie. And weighing Eddie's wife is left traumatized due to multiple encounters with Venom. And when she sees Venom fighting Spider-Man, it's back in the 2000s, it pushes her over the edge. Later still, we learn that before bonding with the symbiote, Eddie was dying of cancer. This is another retcon that adds a massive layer of depth and informs all of Eddie's actions. During the death of Gene DeWolf, Spider-Man reveals the identity of the Sin Eater, a serial killer. And Eddie's faulty reporting during this job is what ultimately sets him down a dark path that leads him to becoming Venom. Eddie interviews a person he believes to be the Sin Eater, but turns out it's a false confession. At the time, we just saw this as Eddie Brock losing his life for being a bad journalist, or being an underwhelming journalist who didn't check his sources. But with this retcon, we see it as something more. Eddie didn't just lose a job, he lost his lifeline. He lost the one thing tying him to the world around him, to sanity. Without a job, he has no distraction from his terminal illness, and this in turn forces Eddie down a self-destructive path that leads him ultimately to the rejected symbiote. The Venom symbiote and Eddie are tied together by their mutual dislike of Spider-Man being rejected and being hurt by him. But this further adds a level to their connection because the symbiote feeds on Eddie's cancer cells and keeps Eddie alive. It doesn't cure his cancer, but it staves off the effects of it. As part of Eddie's ultimate redemption though, he sells his symbiote, donating the money and accepting his inevitable demise. Unlike Wolverine, who was burdened with virtual immortality, Eddie's life is cut short. Seemingly. I mean, look, listen, a lot happens to, to Eddie Brock. He becomes anti-Venom. Uh, he goes on to save the city during Spider Island. He becomes Venom again, and he fights against Null and his forces, becoming a cosmic entity. A lot happens. But the point is that these changes are recontextualized thanks to one single Venom annual. His decision to step away from his grudge against Spider-Man is in part impacted by the one time he bumped into Wolverine at a bar and got a life lesson beat into him. It also helps that Venom always has that spark of morality in him, which is much like how with Wolverine, even during his most feral, there's still a spark of morality in there, that while they make bad decisions, they are still ultimately good people who want to do good. It's just they are consumed by rage, hatred, and animosity. And years later, Venom is forced to clean up, clean up after the Weapon Plus program, the same program that ruined Wolverine's life. And while the two have less direct ties today, all of it is informed by the annual. And it's no surprise that all of this happened during the Donny Cates run on Venom. 
that help distance Venom from Spider-Man and further tie Venom into his own cosmology, his own world. He tied ultimately the Venom and Wolverine or histories together. And we see shades of the Dying Cates run everywhere, even in the Spider-Man 2 game from Insomniac. <laughs> So how does any of this, though, tie in with Deadpool? I mean, there's a couple ways. Obviously, there's the Deadpool core, where there's Venom Pool, uh, an alternate version of Venom who merged with Wade Wilson instead of Eddie Brock. But in the mainline comics, there's a retcon. Deadpool actually assimilated the Venom symbiote before Eddie. Despite being made years after Venom, Deadpool's Secret Secret Wars by Colin Bunn is a 2015 limited series that shows where Deadpool was during the Secret War event. During this event, Deadpool uses the machine that gave Spider-Man the black suit on himself before Spider-Man got a chance to use it. As you can imagine, this means that Deadpool gets his own black suit. Now this event results in the Venom symbiote assimilating a degree of Deadpool's mania, which goes on to supposedly explain why the Venom symbiote is so idiosyncratic and affects the personalities of its hosts. Of course, this creates a minor continuity error because in the mainline comics, Venom doesn't affect the personalities of its hosts at this point in time. It, that was an addition made by the 90s Spider-Man series, but later comics also show that the Venom symbiote does have an impact on personalities. And when we see it with Matt Gargan, it becomes more violent. When we see it with Flash Thompson, the symbiote becomes more heroic. So it does absorb components of the various personalities of these characters. Wear your old clothes, kid. Your hand-me-downs. The symbiote that Peter Parker tried to destroy, Eddie Brock, has embraced. Listen, Venom and Eddie were united by a mutual pain, thanks in part to Spider-Man, not Deadpool's strange understanding of reality. But again, this is a mostly tongue-in-cheek story that shouldn't be taken too seriously. What could be taken more seriously, though, is that Deadpool fought alongside Agent Venom as part of the Thunderbolts, which is arguably the best lineup of the team with some of the worst writing the team has ever had. Seriously, how do you make a team for the Thunderbolts with Red Hulk, Elektra, The Punisher, Deadpool, and Agent Venom and somehow make it boring? But yeah, Agent Venom and Deadpool both have a lot in common since both are dealing with physical ailments who turn to the government for a remedy for Flash, it was the loss of his legs. For Wade, it was cancer. Which is interesting, considering that Eddie himself had cancer. They're both sufferers of terminal illness who use superpowers and their superhero origin as a way to survive. They're turned into what seem like monstrous figures through outside circumstances, though they both have very different ways of dealing with the pain and trauma. Deadpool is unstable and uses humor to cope with pain. Venom lashes out, gradually learning to cope with his trauma in a way that's self-reflective, constructive, and beneficial. All of this to say, it's kind of disappointing how Wolverine and Deadpool are finally reuniting while Venom remains on the outskirts of the cinematic landscape. It's bad enough keeping Venom from being with Spider-Man. That's bad enough as is, but Venom has grown into a character with ties throughout the Marvel Universe. It's disappointing to prevent Venom from exploring these interactions that would only demonstrate how fascinating of a character he ultimately is. And you can't help but feel he's being robbed of these great stories that could be told on film. The same way we haven't seen Wolverine interact with Captain America or Deadpool and Spider-Man hang out. It sucks how Marvel has siloed these characters that they own the rights to, but it sucks more how Sony's deals prevent these characters from playing in this massive playground that can make things so interesting, so much more appealing, and so much more meaningful. Even if all we get are stories comprised of bar fights, Vietnam flashbacks, and interdimensional pirates.